Hey guys, Felix here. Welcome back to InventBox, where the solution is right around the corner. In this tutorial, I want to take a closer look at interrupts. In the last video, we looked at conceptually what interrupts are and how to do them. But I want to take a closer look because there are some common mistakes that we can easily make with interrupts. And I wanted to give you a little bit more detail about how they actually behave. I went ahead and modified our program just slightly so that the interrupt now triggers on falling. So when the switch goes from on to off and I just have it now flipping the LED. So if it was on, it'll turn it off. And if it was off, it'll turn it on. And uh, we haven't done this before, but just so you know, you can digital read a pin that has been set to an output and use it somewhere. Just a little nifty trick. Well, let's go ahead and give it a try. Okay, if I flip the switch, hopefully every time I turn it off, LED 2 will turn on, but it's not. Sometimes it turns on. Wow, that's, isn't it kind of weird? I can just flip the switch back and forth and this light just seems to turn on and off at random, not on the falling edge. So why is it behaving very strangely like this in a seemingly random fashion? Well, there is actually a random component to this, and it's called bouncing. So let me explain bouncing real quick. When we flip the switch like this, there are moving parts inside, and the contacts, as they're sliding, vibrate a little bit, plus there's your hand vibrations. So as this is moving, it actually bounces and the signal jumps up and down and it ends up looking kind of like this as you're initially flipping it. So it, it is high and it goes low, but it jumps around a lot. And so what that does is it causes your interrupt to fire a number of times and it's kind of random as to how many times. So sometimes it might flip your LED and sometimes it might put it back the way it was. And all of that can happen when we have it set up so that it's just the switch hooked up directly to our interrupt pin. Now we can fix that. Uh, and the best way that I have found is through using a capacitor. If we hook up a capacitor to this point, between the, the switch and the interrupt pin, the capacitor can help absorb some of this noise that happens from the bouncing and it'll end up smoothing it out to look something like this. Let's go ahead and add in that capacitor. For this sort of uh, application for debouncing, I have found that roughly a 0.1 UF or 0.1 microfarad capacitor works. It's not specific, it doesn't have to be exact. I happen to have a 0.47 UF laying around, so that's what I'm gonna use. And according to our schematic, we just need to hook up the positive side, which is the side that does not have this white bar. Positive side hooks up to the side that goes into the interrupt pin. And then the negative side of the capacitor needs hooked up to ground. There we go. So let's go ahead and try this out. When I flip the switch, to the off position, the light turns on, and then it turns off. 
on off, exactly what we want. So from this, we can learn that this thing called bouncing can happen when we hook up a input device like a switch or a button or something similar straight into a digital pin. And sometimes we have to be a little bit careful as to how we do that, but we can hook up a capacitor like we've done to debounce the signal. And that actually is the technical term for it. Let's go over some other aspects of the behavior of interrupts. So with interrupts, they actually run very quickly. From the time that your condition is met to the time that this interrupt starts is only four clock cycles, which is extremely fast. And for this reason, a lot of people use interrupts to wake the Arduino up while it's sleeping and run something. Uh, and it only takes four clock cycles to wake up as well. So from sleeping to running something, eight clock cycles, not bad. What about if you have some code in your loop here that is really important and you, you cannot have it be interrupted or it'll mess up? Well, we have a fix for that too. There are actually interrupt enable flags in Arduino and we can modify them with the no interrupts function. And then when we get finished with the code that we don't want to interrupt, we can put interrupts and a re-enable them. So if the program is in this phase of no interrupts and it has an interrupt, well, it actually will not just ignore the interrupt, it will keep in mind that the interrupt triggered while there were while it was in this zone, and then it will run it once interrupts are re-enabled, which is really cool. And what it'll actually do is it does not keep track of how many times the interrupt fires while in this zone. It just keeps track that it happened at least once. So if I am running my non-interruptible code here and I flip an interrupt switch four times and I press an interrupt button twice, at the end of this zone, when interrupts are allowed again, it will run the switch interrupt one time and the button interrupt one time only. And that is the basics of interrupts and even a little bit beyond. Interrupts are typically seen as more of an advanced topic, but I think they're so crucial to being able to keep your code doing what it needs to do in a fast and efficient way that I wanted to go over these really early on so you can get in the habit of using interrupts. Stick around for the next video where I'm going to teach you about serial, which is a way of communicating between the computer and the Arduino.